society. We have four speakers with diverse backgrounds and experiences and a very engaged moderator to whom I will introduce you to in a few moments. I want to start with a short anecdote. A couple of weeks ago, around Women's International Day, a table prepared by the European Institute for Gender Equality arrived to my hands, entitled Glass Ceiling Index, Environment for Working Women. The table included a list of 29 developed countries ranked from the best to the worst in terms of percentage of women in three main sectors, management, boards, and parliament. These three sectors can really be translated in what we name women's leadership. To my surprise and disappointment, I found Israel at number 19 in the list with a shameful grade of 58. I was even more surprised and more disappointed to see that the UK was ranked just below Israel at number 20 with a very similar grade of 57.2. Both our countries were below the OECD average. I thought to myself that as a child, if I were to come home with this grade, my parents would be disappointed too and tell me that I need to do better, to work harder, to put in more effort. This is exactly the way I feel about our countries. I truly believe that they need to put more effort in encouraging and promoting women to leadership roles. Our discussion today is a chance to explore what has been done and what more can be done in both the UK and Israel in the field of gender equality. I hope that sharing our experiences and insights will leave us with ideas about actions we can take as women to support other women. Our four speakers are very inspirational leaders and pioneers in their field. Reverend Libby Lane, was the first woman to be appointed to the role of bishop in the Church of England back in 2014. She has also been a member of the House of Lords since 2015. Professor Ruth Halperin Kadari is a lawyer and the founding head of the Rachman Center for the Advancement of Women at Bar Ilan University. From 2007 to 2018, she served as a member and vice chair of the UN Committee of Experts on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Reverend Dr. Lorna Hood is a former minister and moderator of the Church of Scotland, and today she chairs Youth Link Scotland, the national agency for youth work. She was the third woman to be nominated to the role of moderator in 2012. Ms. Esti Rieder Indurski is an ultra Orthodox Jewish social activist and academic at the Tel Aviv University. She is also a board member of Itach Ma'aki, Women Lawyers for Social Justice, an organization established by a group of women lawyers to give voice to women subjected to social, geographic, national, ethnic, and economic discrimination in the Israeli society. And finally, I am delighted to welcome our moderator today. Reverend Celia Apaji Collins. She's a pastor and the founder president of the Rehobut Foundation, an organization offering leadership development consultancy and mentoring. Reverend Celia has mentored men, corporate executives, pastors, and bishops. For her work, she is recognized as an award-winning leader and has been listed as one of the top 10 most influential Christian women of color in the UK. I hope you all find the conversation valuable. Over to you, Reverend Celia. Uh, Celia, you're, you're muted. The joys of Zoom. Um, so thank you, you so much, Ms. Vivian. Can you hear me now? I am so super excited to be here with such an August We still can hear you, Reverend. We still can you hear you, there's a problem. Me. We can't hear yes, you. My, my mute is off. I, 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 can, no I can hear you, Reverend Celia. I can also hear you. I okay, can hear you. Can hear I can hear the audience saying they can hear me. So I'm going to start again. Well, thank you so much, Ms. Vivian. I am so super excited to be here among such an august company of women leaders, who are not just leaders, but trailblazers 
pioneers, and we're going to be hearing their stories. But before we do, can I thank uh, the Israeli embassy for putting together such a relevant and thought-provoking conversation and narrative. I hope this will not be the end. Um, I think discrimination has become something that we have accepted uh, almost as a norm, but would be too expensive to society if we let that happen. The last time I checked the definition of leadership, it has nothing to do with race, class, or gender. And I hope that we can explore the stories uh, together of these women achievers and hear your scars, your battles, your tears, the good, the bad, and the ugly, um, and how uh, you have been able to get where you are, but also to provoke us and to call us to some kind of action, which is why we're gathered there, women from all over the globe. I am speaking to you right now. I live in the UK, but I'm speaking to you from Ghana right now. And I know the women from Ghana, from Nigeria, from the UK, from Canada, from the US, from all around the world listening today. And may this be the day that the day glass, the phraseology glass ceiling is no longer going to be heard because we just broke it and shattered it into many, many parts. Oh, it's wonderful to welcome the speaker we've been waiting for, also Professor uh, Sher from Israel. Well, my first question um, is to all of you. Can we hear your stories, please? Hold not back. We're interested in the grime and the good, the, the teary bits and the laughy bits. So I'm going to go first of all uh, to Bishop Libby, your story. Uh, thank you. Um, my my grandmother, my nana, left school at 12. Um, she grew up in um, uh, the valleys in Wales, and she left school at the age of 12 to go into domestic service to be a maid. Uh, my mother was um, discouraged from attending university um, and uh, went into teaching. And uh, when she worked for, uh, to become a he the head of a school was told she couldn't be because she didn't have a degree. So my mom did a degree part-time with three children under 10 while holding down a full-time job. Uh, the reason I am where I am today is because the women who went before us broke the ground for us. Um, the generations before me uh, made extraordinary, uh, lived through extraordinary changes and transitions. Um, I stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, most of whom are unknown and unnamed by history. Uh, so um, uh, I grew up in the county that I now serve as bishop, which is a remarkable gift to me that God has called me home um, uh, to be a leader here in the county that shaped and nurtured me and where I found faith. Um, I started going to church on my own uh, as a child at the age of 11. And uh, the village church in Derbyshire uh, loved and nurtured me into faith. Uh, they introduced me to, to Christ and to what it is to live a life in his service. And so from being a child, from being that sort of age, 11, 12 years old, I have understood that uh, that God loves me such that uh, God gave his all for me uh, in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. And my uh, underlying desire uh, from that age has been the question, how can I give all of myself uh, back uh, to God in love and in service to God? Um, I, at school, I thought I might be a civil engineer. What I am is a, is a, a failed builder of bridges. Um, I love bridges. Um, and uh, what I thought I would do as I was growing up was to, um, uh, was to uh, be an engineer, to build bridges, um, uh, to transform people's lives across the globe, um, that kind of uh, civil construction. 
Uh, but it turns out God had a different a different intent for me. Um, and um, uh, having been uh, uh, having had the advantage of going to university, uh, which my uh, mothers before me, my my forebears before me, didn't have the opportunity to do. Um, while I was at university, uh, I discerned the call to ordination before the church uh, legally ordained women. So I began training uh, to be a priest in the Church of England before the church had passed the laws, before the Nate Cosby the established church, before the nation had passed the laws that allowed women to do that. Um, uh, so I began my training in my uh, early mid twenties and was ordained uh, because the legislation passed while I was there, the first year that women could be ordained as priests in the Church of England, um, I was there. Um, and then, uh, as you've heard, uh, six, so just over six years ago, I became the first woman to be consecrated bishop uh, in the Church of England. Celia, thank you for the space to share my story. Thank you, Bishop Libby. You certainly rocked the boat and made history. And I like the fact that you got into a position way before uh, law came to pass. We're going to hear more about that and explore uh, more about uh, the things that motivated you. But I'd love to go on to Ms. Estee, who is an ultra Orthodox Jewish social activist. That in itself is a mouthful. And in that environment, they would, I would love to hear a story. Please don't hold back on the battles. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Um, we all know today is uh, March 24, right? But uh, for me, it's, it's mainly uh, 11 of uh, Nissan, and it's almost uh, Passover, the most uh, hor horrified holiday uh, for Jewish uh, ultra Orthodox uh, women. Uh, 3,700 years ago, God miraculous miraculously took us uh, out of Egypt. Unfortunately, he did it very quickly. We didn't have time to bake uh, bread. And therefore, I have to clean my house now to a spotless status and cover everything with uh, silver paper. Don't ask. So the reason I'm sitting here uh, pretending to be calm is just because I feel very, very privileged to be able to meet with uh, such remarkable women, even uh, online. So in the next few minutes, I will take you to a journey through ultra-Orthodox uh, feminism that is making history now in Israel. And I will be sharing with you the efforts to pave the way between uh, exclusion and extreme uh, restriction against women in the ultra-Orthodox, aka Haredi uh, community, and still be a part of this uh, community and still be religious uh, women. Okay, I will be also sharing with you my call for a better, sustained future for ourselves, women all over the world, and not only in Israel, but all over the world, and to our daughters and to our daughter daughters. So, a few years ago, I was a man working as a journalist. No, you are not lost in translation. And yes, although English is my mother tongue, I definitely meant what I just said. I was a man working in an ultra-Orthodox uh, newspaper. I was read by thousands and thousands of people that didn't know that I'm actually a woman. I was a man with a very uh, prestige work, high rank status, and my audience, the readers, didn't know that I'm going on high heels to work. But the matter of fact, at that time, I didn't realize there is something wrong with the situation that I'm a woman and I'm writing under a male's uh, name. Because at that time I was a Haredi woman waiting for a Jewish uh, divorce, which called a get. And uh, after that, I was, uh, after a long time, I was uh, a young uh, divorcee with a child and no alimonies, because you see, in order to get the divorce paper, to get the Jewish uh, get, I had to give up the alimonies. So uh, I had to do whatever I could do to survive. I found a job in a, in a newspaper and, you know, it's not easy to be a, an, an, a single mom anywhere, but it's not very not easy to be a single mom in the ultra orthodox world. So the deception seems perfectly natural normal to me. They're telling you to write under a man's name. This is what you do. After all, if a woman uh, 
wants to, wants this job and she doesn't want to write recipes, then and she has an opinion, then uh, she doesn't have any other uh, alternative but to write under a male's name or to put it in the world of my enlightened editors at the time, the average ultra-Orthodox man is not ready yet to hear an opinion from a woman. Gladly he said yet. Let's ask him now what he thinks. He didn't change his mind. It is important to say that this paper that I worked for was not special in any way. Hiding women is a common thing among the printed and even the digital ultra-Orthodox media. Some delete pictures of women, some vanish them with Photoshop, some use only initials, and some even erase the word women. It is also important to point that I'm talking of my community, the ultra-Orthodox community, it's only 12% of the population in Israel. But although it is important to stay in contact, I must say that exclusion of women become now popular in Israel in general, and that's because the ultra-Orthodox parties are very uh, powerful, as we saw only yesterday, and because they are essential to any government, as we saw yesterday, and because there is no separation between uh, religious and state in Israel. But all this came to my mind only after I remarried, when I was busy as a divorcee working, I didn't have time for, for this. And actually, I married my ex-husband's attorney, there is a God, you see. And uh, I had some spare time to go to university, okay? I was 40 years old and I went to do my first, uh, my first degree and then my master's and soon hopefully I will be finishing my, uh, uh, my uh, PhD. And what is more relevant, I became a feminist, a Haredi feminist. And I became part of the latest wave in history of uh, feminists, of women that believe in God. They want to follow the, the, the commandments, but they also have to have, they also want to have basic uh, human rights. Crazy, right? Because it's uh, 2021, isn't it? So uh, this is my story briefly. I will um, continue later if you want. Well, thank you. Um, that as is an interesting story. And again, we're going to wait to hear more about you writing um, under the guise of a man and why we need to live in a world like that. But thank you so much for an interesting story. I'm going to go very quickly to uh, Dr. Lorna Hood. Dr. Lorna, you have held um, 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 one of the highest positions, uh, religious positions for a woman that a woman can hold in, in, a, in a religion that may be hostile to women leadership. We'd love to hear your story. And the fact that you've been honored by the queen for the transformational work, still in a suit of a woman uh, that you've been able to do across uh, the continent. Thank you, your story, ma'am. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak to you and to be involved with uh, such wonderful women uh, today. Um, I was ordained at the age of 25. Uh, and um, into, inducted into my very first charge at the age of 26. Uh, that was in 1978 and 1979. And the Church of Scotland uh, decided that they would ordain women in 1968. So I was just 10 years after the first ordination. Um, and, and unlike Libby, we didn't have to wait for, for the national government, the Church, Church of Scotland has, has its, its own uh, government system. So uh, when the Church of Scotland decided they were going to ordain women, after quite a long battle, to be fair, um, it went ahead. So, so 10 years later, uh, if you can imagine, there are still not a huge number of, of women ministers. And also in Scotland, in the Church of Scotland, um, you apply for a congregation, you're not placed in a congregation. So uh, at the end of my probationary period and having been ordained uh, for a year as an assistant where I was in Edinburgh, I had to start applying for vacant charges. And uh, one of the charges I applied for was, was Renfrew North. Now also in those days there were a lot of people applying for charges and uh, I'm told there were something like 30 people were applying for, for this charge. Uh, and I got it. But the story is that in the town of Renfrew, which is a town just outside Glasgow, 
uh, very much the commuter town with its own industry, etc. In all the shops, in all the pubs, in, in all the various places, when they heard it was a woman who was coming to Renfrew North, the only question they asked was, in Scottish terms, was there nobody else? Was there nobody else that could get that charge? Uh, so I then ha have to preach in front of the congregation and then the, king the congregation vote on me to decide. And it's still the same situation today. So you preach in the congregation and then they vote. So you can imagine the apprehension. The church was packed. And uh, I'm, I'm told because you then go out so you don't see the vote. Now it's a secret ballot, but in those days it was standing up in your in your place, standing up, you know, where you were sitting in your pew. And I'm I'm told the story, and a number of people have told me about that there was a couple in the congregation who decided they did not want a woman minister under no circumstances. I could have been the greatest preacher ever, the most wonderful pastor, but I was a woman. So in the nursing home was their elderly mother. She hadn't been out in the nursing home for a few years, but they got her out that Sunday and she sat between them. And when it came to the vote, to vote against me, they hauled her up. I'm told there was quite a lot of, of hissing in the congregation and I, I was elected by, by a large majority. So I became the minister of Renfrew North. And in the Church of Scotland, although they vote for you as a minister, once you're there, nothing they can do about it, unless, unless things go really disastrously wrong. So, so I was there for 37 and a half years. And in that time, uh, first of all, I was married a week after I was inducted into the charge. And then five years later, I had my first child. And uh, four and a half years after that, I had my second child. So I was involved, as we'll probably speak about later, in, in maternity leave in the Church of Scotland, which was a, a completely new thing for them. I've always said in that time, I, I had great support. A, a lot of the people who were ministers beside me, some I'd been at school with, some I'd been at university with, and I, I never, ever felt the prejudice. When I became moderator, and although I was a third woman, I was the first parish minister to be moderator. And I went to different parts of the country. I went up to the Isle of Skye, Loch Caron and Skye Presbytery, which is theologically on the right wing. I was only allowed to preach in two churches on the island. I was there for 10 days. There was only two churches in the island I was allowed to preach up in the very north of the island. And another meeting, organized by the guild it used to be the women's guild it's now just the guild i didn't say anything unusual i only said that that they were equal before god that they had their gifts and their talents and they were going out of that congregation they were going out that day some of them in tears and it made me realize that for a lot of my ministry i had been in a bubble the bubble where i had been accepted the bubble where because I was young and female and they needed those young and female on committees, I was given lots of opportunities. And it made me realise that I had been in that bubble and blind to what some of, of my sisters were experiencing in other parts of the country and the prejudice that, that they were putting up with. So I think that was very much an eye opener for me. But I've now retired. Um, I know early retirement, but not, not, not too much, full retirement now. And uh, as you say, I'm uh, cheering YouthLink and, um, and doing what I can in, in various ways. So that's my story. Speak a bit more of it later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the difference we make. And um, I'm sure that everybody is excited about these journeys and it feels like the stories are the same, the fights are the same in different contexts. Um, I want to uh, encourage um, our audience, to please put your comments. I know you've been doing that. Keep putting the comments out, sharing uh, little bits and nuggets that you're gleaning, but also put your questions in because hopefully we will have a little bit of time at the end to explore some of the questions that you have. But I'm going to go on to Professor Ruth. Now you've done it all, seen it all, bought the t-shirt, the cap and everything. You've been involved with the UN, you've been involved with uh, uh, politics and, and influencing policy. 
um, uh, at your level, bringing your expert opinion, and then in academia, your story, man. Thank you. It's, I just want to say first that it's a huge honor and uh, Bishop Libby spoke about standing on the shoulders of giants. So I feel that this is a convention of, of giants and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be part of it. Um, and uh, to Esti, it's not just the ultra-Orthodox women who <laughs> have been pulled out from the kitchen now, and it's actually a welcome distraction. Uh, but after we're done, going right away to preparations for Passover. Um, so I, I am um, an observant uh, Jewish woman. I was brought up um, within uh, mainstream Orthodoxy in Israel. Uh, both my parents, uh, my late parents, uh, were Holocaust survivors. And my mother had to give up her dream of attaining education. Um, her dream was to be a doctor. Of course, that dream never materialized, but uh, thank God she did live to uh, found a family in Israel. We are three daughters and I'm the youngest. And I think that it is, um, there, there's something to that because it's as if uh, my late father's um, aspirations for um, higher education and learning and uh, academic uh, career uh, were all really um, brought down uh, onto, onto me. And I remember that as a child, um, you know, you ask to think about personal stories. So um, when I was just, um, I think, 11, um, uh, there was a competition in uh, primary school um, on Judaism, um, learning the scriptures. And I should have actually been the first place, but uh, because the prize for the first um, um, place would have been uh, the Talmud, uh, a set of the Talmud, the Gemara, um, they obviously said that uh, a girl um, should not be given that prize. So they uh, downgraded me to second place so I could just get the Bible. Um, you know, being awarded with a Bible is okay for a little girl, but not more than that. Um, and the same pattern actually followed when I uh, studied law. And I went into law knowing vaguely, first of all, that I want to have an academic career and that law would have something to do with real life. Um, and, and during my studies, my uh, first degree law studies in Israel, um, again, there was a competition, this time of essays in Jewish law. And, uh, and I wrote an essay. And uh, again, I actually, this time I did receive the first prize, but the man with whom I competed, who actually asked me um, unofficially to withdraw my essay, because he wouldn't have been wanted to uh, defeat a woman. And then eventually he ended up second place and I was first place. He never showed up for the, um, for the uh, reception of the, of the prizes. So these are you know anecdotal stories, but there's obviously a lot more into them because during all these years, I had no idea what actually feminism was or what gender was or I could not also place this tension between religiosity and being religiously committed and at the same time aspiring for equality, for equal opportunities, for equal possibilities. The revelation for me, and I purposely say revelation, um, was when I pursued my doctorate degree at, at Yale University and there were two separate arenas there. First, I had the privilege of taking Professor Catherine McKinnon's course on feminism and law. And then I was exposed to a different way of religious life within orthodoxy, egalitarianism. And that was really the first time that I could formulate for myself what I want to do in life, what I, my personal identity is, and what I want to take back with me coming back to Israel, pursuing my academic uh, career, and fighting for women's rights within Judaism, within Jewish law, within Israeli law, without having to give up my personal commitment for religiosity, for my religious belief, my religious identity, it, it, it is one of the gravest injustices 
that women should be asked if they want to maintain these both commitments to feminism and gender equality and to religiosity, it is women who would be asked or demanded or expected to give up one of these commitments. But these two are identical identities. Both of them form the essential part, my core identity as a Jewish religious observant feminist woman. And I don't want to give up any of them. And I want, and this is what I've been doing to devote my academic career and skills and my activism so that women would never have to give up either one of these identities. Wow, Professor Ruth, I think you summed it up for us all. And this is our why, why I just made a little note myself to say, I'm glad, glad I'm hearing these stories because something is happening inside of me. I'm both provoked to come out of my cave, to have a louder voice and to make sure that history is not repeating itself and, and to move on to make sure that these ridiculous stories uh, don't, we don't get to hear about them again because we make a difference for the generation coming up. Well, we want to delve deeper and to hear uh, more about your story. So I'm going to go straight to Bishop Libby and ask you, as the first female bishop in the Anglican Church, what do you see as contributing factor to that change? I mean, you made history. It was a big debate come forth, going back and forth for many years. And what factors have helped uh, us reach the point now where we're accepting others other than yourself? And it's not just a token ordination. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, I was the first uh, woman to be bishop in the Church of England. The Anglican Church is a worldwide communion of Christian churches, and uh, the first woman priest in the Anglican communion was a Chinese Christian woman ordained in Hong Kong during the First World War. The first woman bishop was Bishop Barbara Harris, an African-American uh, woman uh, made uh, bishop in Boston. Um, so uh, as I've referred to before, um, whatever um, uh, attention or recognition I get, it is because others have been before me um, and, uh, and paved that women and men together and uh, uh, women and men of all faiths and none um, who have fought and struggled and prayed. Um, my own um, leadership journey has been um, hugely influenced by uh, sisters and brothers in, in, uh, in other faith communities, um, uh, Jewish faith communities in this, in this country, um, uh, Reform and, uh, and Orthodox and um, uh, uh, Muslim sisters and brothers, as well as Christian uh, sisters and brothers, uh, all of whom who have um, help to shape and influence who I am and, and uh, how I exercise my leadership. And um, I, I recognize there's a limit to who we can have here today and, and what we can say, but um, uh, just to be really clear that um, uh, the, the place of women in the UK is, uh, ha has been hugely influenced by um, women and men of other faiths as well as Christian leaders. Um, and, uh, and I know that uh, leadership in Israel has been hugely influenced by women of other faiths, in, in, as well as those who are, who are Jewish. So there's something really important about um, the recognition that we, uh, that we belong to one another um, and that it's not me that's got me to the place that I am, but it is my sisters and brothers alongside me um, who... Um, uh, did the hard work and opened the door so I could step through it. And, and certainly you mentioned about those who've come after me, uh, a mark of whether I have done this well is, is how many women have come after me. Um, and so there's a, a, a real sense of, of uh, I've held this place well enough uh, because uh, uh, 25 and counting um, other women have have come behind me. Um, uh, I'm also conscious that there are things that still need to be addressed because although there are more women now who sit within leadership in the Church of England, we were he hearing early 
uh, about the fact that there are not enough women in other places of leadership, whether that's in politics or business or public life, more generally in the UK as in Israel. And, um, and we have much to learn, uh, therefore, from uh, other places around the world. Um, but that um, although there are more women now in leadership in the Church of England and um, uh, there, there are not enough uh, people of uh, minority ethnic backgrounds or uh, people from um, uh, other socioeconomic backgrounds who, um, who don't, for whom access into places of influence and power is restricted, but actually um, if we take seriously those who have uh, sacrificed so that we of this gener we women of this generation can be where we are, uh, part of that responsibility uh, is to look to those who are currently excluded um, uh, and to say what's my part in, in opening the space uh, for other excluded people to have equal opportunity, equal choice, equal access, uh, equal equal resource. Thank you, Bishop. Um, much work to be done, much work, much, many more challenges, but you've left us with two things that I want to remind people so they don't forget. Um, you did say something very powerful. You said the mark of how well you've done is, is how many women take their place after you. And I think that's a well, uh, a good marker for all of us that in all of our labors, those should, are outcomes we should be looking out for and to make sure that um, we make room for others. Thank you, I think that's a very, very important point. I'm gonna go straight to esteem. I esteem female leader and activist. What are you and other women doing to increase women's voices within your own community? I'm sure the challenge there is, is perhaps fiercer than many of us could imagine. What are you doing? Well, um... You know, I'm very touched with what uh, uh, people said before me. So, um, but I want first to say that the changes within the uh, Haredi uh, community have been uh, really identified in recent years, and many transformation have taken place in my sector. And you know, it, it's uh, usually painted in black and white, but it, it, it's not really a, a black and white. And uh, these uh, changes have especially thrived in spheres in which Haredi women are uh, operated. So uh, what do we do? What do I do? It would be impossible to describe in two or three uh, minutes because you could find Haredi brave women doing remarkable things in any field you could really imagine from integrating women in a better position in the business world or politics or fight uh, children and women sexual molesters. And today I heard that a friend of mine, her name is also Esti, Esti Salomon, she's getting a prize for integrating Haredi women in the IDF. And this is crazy because Haredi men are not uh, going there, but she integrates Haredi women that are working there in, in computers. So, and we're doing really everything, but I want to uh, mention one uh, phenomenon that Professor Ruth Kadari started to speak about it, and it really shows that all the struggles are really uh, mutual. And that's, uh, uh, this is something that I'm now a part of, and I'm also doing my research about. This is Haredi women that are learning the Talmud, Professor Kadari. There are new uh, women like this. So uh, the background to all uh, Haredi women activism in Israel is really to fight the extremism, as I just said uh, uh, before. And the extremism is, is something new. I grew up Haredi and uh, I grew up in, in ultra-Orthodox schools and things today are much worse than they used to be. It's not, and I was religious my entire life and I came from a religious family and extremism today is really something that is very difficult for women uh, to bear. And one of the things that Haredi women are doing these days, and this is brand new, is to try to break the uh, religious and cultural barrier of uh, learning the Talmud, learning this book that Professor Ruth Kadari couldn't have when she was uh, a child and Haredi women can't have uh, uh, today. 
And, you know, women that engage in uh, the study of Talmud are li likely to confront a social uh, opposition. They call us crazy, uh, lunatics, uh, uh, reform, uh, what, whatever, whatever you want. And uh, women that are, uh, uh, the, the learners are also, they find uh, a text that is very difficult to, to engage because it was written by men, for men, and it's often very uh, misogynic. Uh, these challenges are relevant, I think, to any woman who learn a uh, religious text, which I think uh, the bishop and the reverend here will agree, but it's very, very um, uh, um, relevant to Haredi women because the, the ultra orthodox community is defined as a learning community. The men are defined by learning this Talmud that the Haredi women, are, they, can, they can't uh, touch it. So when I start my research and when I, I wanted to learn it myself, I thought maybe there are five crazy women like me. And, you know, it will be an easy research, not a lot of interviews. But uh, I found 50 women already that are learning um, every week, a few times a week, uh, every day, one page, uh, of different kinds of women. And they're learning Talmud now. Maybe the audience, I can't see the audience, but maybe some are laughing. <laughs> she found 50 women, big deal. But I must tell you that uh, first, I believe in the power of individuals and small groups to change the present and the future. And also, when I look at Bishop Libby and Reverend Dr. Leona, and I realize that even if Haredi women don't realize it now, and even if Haredi men are very frightened by it and they will try to prevent it, Haredi women will be a part of religious le leadership thanks to the baby steps that me and my friend are just now uh, beginning to uh, take. Thank you, thank you so much. I, um, the, the, it has been said that the question is not who is gonna let me, it's who's gonna stop me. I like that, I like that, who's gonna stop us? Um, Reverend Lorna, Dr. Lorna, as a woman minister and moderator, you have spearheaded definitely policy change. Can you tell us why this is so important? So we've heard stories from um, ordinary families coming up, fighting through our families, fighting through the modeling that's been left, uh, left for us uh, through grassroots. But why is policy change important? And especially at this time. So, policy change needs to happen because you, you need always the laws to back things up. Um, I, I saw in the, the, the chat thing, people saying, what, what is a moderator? <laughs> Uh, and in the Church of Scotland, we are, we are ruled by a, a yearly meeting of the General Assembly. And that's where we, we pass our, our laws, our, our rules, our, our regulations, which then filter down to the church. So basically, although you can have things at grassroots level, if you really want to, to make real changes, they have to come also up, up here, up at the top of the General Assembly. And the General Assembly consists of a mixture, equal mixture, of ministers, elders, and, and also uh, the diaconate. Uh, and we meet yearly, and the moderator is the person who literally chairs that assembly. Uh, it's a week of, uh, of meetings, of debates, of policy change. And as moderator, you, you, chain, you chair that. And then for the next year, basically you're the face of the church. You know, you're, you go out in a, a big PR job, really. Um, but, but you're also involved in all the things that are happening in the church. The big policy change that I was in, involved in in the 1980s, uh, and nowadays it may seem, you know, you know, well, that's not a big thing, that's not a big deal, but in those days it was, and that was maternity leave. Mm -hmm. Because as, uh, as having a, a, a baby, uh, and in those days maternity leave was not nearly as generous as it is now. It was, I think, something like 12 weeks. And so when I um, phoned, our church offices are, are known as 121 because they are situated at 121 George Street. So in Scotland, everyone just talks about 121. So when I phoned 121 and said, um, what do I do about maternity leave? Oh, um, what, do you, what do you think? 
And so maternity pay at that time was equal to what a locum would get for doing it. So they said, just work it out yourself. Just work it out yourself. So that was okay and it worked. And then what happened after that was that when anyone else who got pregnant phoned, they would say, ah, just phone Lorna Hood. She'll tell you what to do. So I thought, this can't go on like this. We need some kind of decision. So I took it to the General Assembly. I proposed a motion that they um, look into maternity leave for women ministers. And that was accepted unanimously. And the committee was set up. And I always remember the first meeting, of course, if you propose something, you then land in the committee. So the first meeting of that committee, I was really uplifted because all the others were men, apart from me. And I thought, here they are, they're deciding on women's maternity leave. But the one thing they said was, let's get what the maternity leave and regulations are for all the other professions, doctors, teachers, lawyers, etc. And then they said, because we want to do the very best for our women in the ministry. And they did that. And we, we did have one of the best in its day. And of course, that has changed with, with rules and regulations over the years. But the other thing in Scotland is that we, we have been blessed, and I, and I say blessed, with, with women leaders in politics as well. Um, our First Minister is a woman. Uh, the leader of the Conservative opposition is a woman. And until not all that long ago, uh, the Labour Party, uh, a woman. So we had three women in the Scottish Parliament. So therefore, in Scotland, it, it, it's not so unusual. And yet there is still within the religious sphere, still a kind of um, apprehension that, that's there. Uh, there has been another woman moderator uh, after me, and I think we will now always be, uh, be mindful of that gender balance. And in fact, we have in the Church of Scotland, um, Catherine Gilmore, who is uh, the gender justice officer. So that in, in all our policies and all the decisions that we have to make, gender justice is taken into account. And, and that I think is, is great for, for, for how far we've come just since the ordination in, in 1968. Because in the life of the church, that's a tiny, tiny part. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lorna. Interesting thoughts. Um, definitely women have to change our relationship with power. Absolutely definitely. We have to change our outlook and bring our children up to change their outlook on power and on influence. We need to go for it. Professor uh, Ruth, um, gender equity and gender justice, is, you're not a stranger to it. Your main focus is women's rights from a legal perspective. How would you respond to what we've heard from Dr. Lorna today and in relation to the Israeli context and Jewish law? You're, you're on mute, ma'am. Yes. So following up on um, your um, last remark about changing our relationship with power, law is power. And Judaism is a religion of laws. Uh, main tenet in Judaism is Jewish law. So my engagement with the law and with Jewish law is, is a natural combination. And I'm listening, I'm, I'm hearing um, our, our two colleagues from um, the Church of England and the Church of, of Scotland, and, and I'm, I'm envious <laughs> because it, it seems that they really managed to um, integrate the perspective of gender justice into the making of the laws. And we in Orthodox Judaism, and this is to be differentiated from Reform Judaism and Conservative Judaism, but I'm talking about Orthodox Judaism, Judaism not just because I myself, uh, as I said, was brought up Orthodox and because ST here is, uh, is ultra-Orthodox, but because Orthodox Judaism is in fact the religion of the state of Israel. As ST mentioned, there is no separation of religion and state or uh, religion and law in Israel. And the area in which uh, I specialize in is, is family law. This is actually where everything gets integrated into it. It's, it's the juncture 
of the non-separation between religion and law and state in Israel because there is no civil marriages and divorces in Israel, only religious marriages and divorces in Israel. So this is where our struggle is. And as, as, as the uh, founding uh, academic director of the Rackman Center, the Rackman Center was um, named after the late Rabbi Rackman, who actually dedicated his um, public rabbinical career um, for the rights of women within Jewish law and within Judaism, and, and actually paid a high personal price for that within orthodoxy. So that's what we are fighting for following on his uh, vision. And we're struggling to make changes and changes are coming. It's, it was unheard of even 10 years ago that women would actually serve as um, legal advisors within rabbinical courts. And this is a struggle that the Rackman Center has led and we succeeded in it. So it's still a long way before women could actually be religious judges, religious deciders within rabbinical courts. But as Esti said, there are already so many women who are mastering the Jewish law, who are becoming literate in Jewish law, and we are preparing the appeal to the High Court of Justice because the High Court of Justice does have the supervisory power over the rabbinical court. It's very complex, but there are ways in which we can maneuver, and that's what that's what we're doing. And I just want to mention one last um, thing. Um, you mentioned that I was also on the um, UN, on the Committee on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, uh, the body that supervises the implementation of the CEDAW Convention. And one of the most um, uh, moving experiences that I had when sitting 12 years on the committee and hearing reports from countries and hearing reports from civil society and from women. So one of the most moving experience was to hear women, Muslim women, Muslim feminists from Arab countries, from African countries, from Southeast Asia, coming and giving their information to the committee and listening to them it was so many times as if i heard myself or as if i would hear esti and our other friends who are struggling within the patriarchal religions to make the changes from from within and i think that a panel like this when we can meet together and sharing the same cause is another example of how powerful this sharing uh, is and and the potential that that's that's in it Thank you so much, Professor Ruth. I mean, I hope that I know Miss Vivian is on there. She's, she's waiting for me. Uh, she's on there hearing us. We're listening and waiting out for a part two. Um, I just want to read you a couple of comments from our chats because our audience is part of this journey and they're putting in their thoughts too and their experiences. You don't have to be an anti-man to be pro-woman. And I want to read you uh, something that one of our gentlemen has said. Great to see the comment from you, Toby. He says, I am a man present this afternoon. I feel that not only do women need to find a voice among themselves, but also that men hear that voice. He says, by the way, I come from a faith tradition with women in ministry since 1865, yet we still do not have gender equality. It's a long struggle. Thank you so much, Paul. You are right. It's a long struggle and it doesn't end there. A luta continuum, as they say. Uh, a couple of questions very quickly uh, before we go from our audience. From Toby, he says, how do you keep the torch uh, burning towards the young generation? I'm so glad uh, that somebody's connected uh, a millennial and a young generation to this conversation. How do you keep the torch burning towards the young generation and inspire you to support gender equality? What practical advice would you give for women trying to make a difference in the world? And I would love one minute answers from all of my uh, 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 panelists, please. Professor Ruth, I'm coming to you first. Education. Education, 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 and um, uh, personal example, role models, um, and talking to the boys and not just the girls. I myself am fortunate to have three sons and, and a daughter. And, and, and I, I, I know, and I've heard it from, you know, from the teachers of my sons that um, without 
even you know you don't really have to to preach it's just what you do and how you behave and how you act that this um uh the commitment to to human rights and to gender equality is is being is being passed passed on uh but to succeed in this uh, education you do have to have the commitment of the of the state also and the policy makers and and you have to work to integrate it into the official educational system and the uh, unofficial educational system and um it, it's 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 a journey it's a it's a long journey a long journey but we'll get there one step at a time bishop libby uh, to allow space for um, the voices of young people themselves to be heard and to influence um, uh, our present and our and their future. Um, so in terms of passing the torch on, not to, for them to exercise the, the influence that they have now, that they don't need to wait um, to do that. We have much to learn from um, the generations that come uh, that come after us. And the other thing is, um, it can be very hard to uh, imagine what you have never seen. Uh, and so um, uh, enabling our young people to, and that may mean us needing to be really creative and collaborative and inventive uh, if we don't have those role models ourselves immediately to enable um, our young people to see themselves uh, in a different future. It's hard to imagine what you haven't seen. Good. Um, I'm going to go to Mrs. Steve. Yes, I want to Just give. Briefly, how do we keep yes, the torch I want burning? To give, uh, uh, an example for what Bishop Levy just said. Uh, I have. Uh, nephews and nieces, which are also very ultra orthodox, and they see me, this not the average uh, aunt, and that learning uh, Talmud. And in the Talmud, there is a phrase uh, women are light minded, or something like that. They can't uh, think uh, through. And my nephew was in, in a yeshiva in, 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 in a class, and he read in, and they learned this uh, thing. And the rabbi said that, and my nephew stood up and said, I don't think this is true regarding to all women. Now, it doesn't matter what the rabbi told him. It doesn't, nothing matters. It matters that he said that because he knew me. It, it, it matters that other boys heard that, and they would be different regardless of the fact that probably the rabbi scolded him and etc. So, as Bishop Libby said, it's important to see and for them to imagine that, okay, it's written that, that thing is written in the Talmud, but I know Esti and she's not like that. And maybe other women are not like that. And he changed, I changed his uh, mind and I don't know how many hundreds of learning in the same class uh, forever. Wow. Wow, I mean, uh, uh, some of what you said just means that this education has to start from home. Ideologies are built from home. I think they say that the, the mind is the womb of your life. And so whatever we believe, we live out. And maybe as an African woman, I can also say this, that we bring up our women a certain way, but maybe we ought to educate our men a certain way concerning women before they get somewhere where somebody poisons the mind. Uh, Dr. Lorna, last word to you, ma'am. I agree with everything that's been said, but the one thing I'd say is, 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 is don't, don't rest on what we've achieved because it could so very easily fall backwards. And it is so easy, and I, as I said at the very beginning, I sometimes think I was just in a bubble because everything was fine with me. Don't rest on, on, on where we are. We have to always be aware. And I think of some, some churches in different parts of the world that, that did have women, I think the church in Australia, and now they're saying no. So they've got, they have, for my mind, they've gone backwards. And so we've, we've made great progress, great steps forward, but we could lose it so very, very easily. And we have to, to be what we can see and we cannot be what we cannot see. So we always, always, always have to be aware. 
that we we have a responsibility, but we also cannot rest on our laurels and what we have achieved cannot be lost just because we've we've accepted where we are. There is still much to be achieved and still much to be done for equality in so many awesome. parts of the world. And our awesome, own. awesome. I can we ask a question? We, we've almost run out of time, but we beg your leave for just a few minutes because we started a little bit late. And she said that, have we seen a lot of change on these journeys? Have you all seen a lot of change on these journeys? So one, two, three uh, uh, word answers would be great. Have you seen a lot of change on these journeys? Is, are we still got to be postured to be hopeful? Do we give up our shoulders slumped or are we revving up for the next move up high? Bishop Libby. It depends when you ask me whether I, my shoulders are slumped or whether I'm revved up for what comes next. I think uh, it's important that we are um, uh, honest with God and honest with ourselves and honest with one another. And sometimes we get ground down. Um, uh, but my faith teaches me um, that um, uh, God will make all things new. Um, and actually, my experience teaches me that, um, uh, that there is grace and mercy and joy in the traveling and among those that we travel with. So although there may be occasions when my shoulders are slumped, actually what lies underneath is, uh, is, uh, is hope. Is hope. I like that. I like hope. Professor Ruth, what, have we come far? What changes have we seen? I'm muted again, sorry. We've come very, very far. It's only a hundred years since women actually became citizens, since women got the suffrage. And in Switzerland, it was only in 1974, right? The struggle of religious women now is exactly the struggle to become citizens, full citizens within religion, to be part of the process, to sit at the table, to be part in Judaism, to be part of the halachic, the Jewish legal process, to have our voices heard and known. And, and we are sitting on the shoulders of those great grandmothers who fought for the suffrage within public so state society at large. And now we're implementing it, each one of us within our own communities and our own religious communities. And I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. If I weren't optimistic, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. Although, as, as Reverend Dr. Lorna said, there are setbacks and we are now living within a period, a very troubling, a very worrisome period. But we should, you know, have faith in, in our own strength and in, in each other and, and in the assistance of, of God up there. Yeah, and the setbacks have actually what uh, spread you all into action as trailblazers. So maybe we need these setbacks to keep us from resting on our laurels and pushing us more forward. Mrs. Stee, a short word from you, ma'am. Um, I want to quote uh, two women. The first one is uh, Olympia de Goose. And she said that uh, ignorance, neglect, or contempt for the right of women are the sole cause of government uh, corruption. So uh, we cannot um, be pessimistic or whatever. We have to keep on uh, the, the struggle. And I want to quote another activist. Her name is Lila Watson. She's an aboriginal uh, feminist from Australia. And she's saying like this, if you are coming to help me, then don't bother. But if you understand that your liberation depends on my liberation, and I understand that my liberation depends on your liberation, then let's work together. And I think this is really summarized. Awesome. Uh, we saw here today that all our fights are really and struggles are uh, connected with one another. And only if we understand that, and then we can, um, my husband is yelling downstairs, okay? And then we can, um, uh, we can work together and uh, change. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, all too often as good things come, they have to come to an end. Before we go, though, Abigail says, and we have women and men from around the world, from Africa, from Europe, from, from the UK. Thank you very much, from Israel. She said, listening to these inspirational panelists has been a privilege. I think that's 
she echoes how I feel. And, and, and Paul says society is impoverished by the degree to which it limits the participation of women and we couldn't agree more. I'm gonna ask one word, just one word calls to action from each one of our esteemed panelists. Just one word from you, Dr. Lorna, call to action, challenge us, inspire us, push us off um, our place of comfort. Can I just say quickly, I visited Yad Vashem and I was so caught up going into, going down into, and it was one candle that was lighting the whole, one light, and yet you thought the whole room was lit up. That's what we're called to be. We're called to be that light in gaining equality, in fighting for gender equality, but be that light that shines out to all, and we're all called upon to be that light. That's, that's all with the audacity awesome. of hope beside us. Go be that light. Go be that light. Bishop, go be that light, Bishop Libby. Uh, use the voice you have. Use the voice uh, you have. Whatever circumstance you're in, whatever, wherever you feel you are in the, 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 the circumstances of your community or society or across the world, um, you, you do have voice. So use the voice you have. You do have voice. Use it. Professor Ruth. Um, going back to feminist origins, sisterhood. Sisterhood is powerful while taking into consideration all the differences between us there is still more that connects and together we are much much more powerful together we're much powerful sisterhood taking place right now this is steep. well i'm sorry i used the quotes before it was a good time to use them now but i will say um solidarity and this is what uh, this uh, panel today uh, taught me that uh, women and men should be solidary to, to one another because really I heard myself through Bishop Libby and through Reverend Dr. Leona and through Professor Ruth and I, 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 I felt that the audience heard us, uh, uh, felt himself through and uh, we really have to work together for the cause of uh, women's uh, right. So to sum it up, thank you. Go be that light. Use your voice. Sisterhood is powerful solidarity. Well, 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 closing words from me as we come to a close in part one and open part two will come up. The most important thing is that we do something uh, with what we've been inspired to do. Um, I, I, I want to put it this way. Uh, uh, um, they say that it is better to light a candle than to curse the dark. So when you find yourself cursing the dark, ask yourself if you're lighting a candle. One of my own favorite saying is this, you're never limited by what you don't have. You're only limited by what you don't do. Let's get some women, not just complaining, but going out into our spaces, into our cultures, into our communities, into our environment. If we have to do what Mrs. T did and put a man's name and put a woman's name and then expose ourselves differently, let's make our voices heard. We can do something about the future, the youth, and the younger generation are looking up to us and we must all promise ourselves, I will never leave this world as we found it. Bishop Libby's mother refused to be uneducated. She found a way, we can always find a way. Thank you so much to the Israeli embassy for allowing us to have this conversation. We could have gone on for ages. Thank you to our panelists who have um, and not just listened but been actively engaging on a, on a conversation on the other side of the chat. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you, Ms. Vivian. Thank you to Ms. Chloe uh, for the work that you put in here. Thank you all and shalom. Thank you. Go make a difference and let the narrative and the story be different. Thank you to our panelists for your stories, uh, for your candidness and for challenging us. God bless you.